and want to make sure trials will support the label claim. And you look at different studies, some studies you can develop them in a parallel fashion. Sometimes they have to be developed in a sequential uh, fashion. And when you execute the uh, uh, clinical development plan, it's an iterative procedure. You're learning uh, and you're improving, right? So you need to consider the non-clinical milestones when you're developing uh, uh, in the clinical development stage. And you want to determine which objective will be answered by individual studies, which by uh, pool analysis. So we'll come back to this exploration and confirmation, all right? It's a phase one, two, three, four development process. For exploratory, we do estimation, point estimate, interval estimate. For confirmatory purposes, we do hypothesis testing. It's a learning process of <clears throat> obtaining information and making decision. And design considerations for exploratory and confirmatory could be different. And analysis methods depend on objectives. For labeling, you may consider the entire database. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, with these two lectures, we completed this uh, 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 CDP program plan. Uh, okay. Uh, today we're going to focus on phase one studies. Uh, so let's just do a very quick review. Uh, the first two lectures was talking about individual clinical trial. So we talk about the uh, uh, the scientific foundation about drug development based on clinical trials. And the, then the, the next two lectures will talk about CDP, clinical development plan, as to how you want to develop a new drug or a drug candidate um, into a successful drug. And of course, in the previous lecture, we talked about phase one, phase two, phase three trials. And today we're gonna to focus on phase one trials. Uh, in phase one trials, we need to achieve two objectives. One is to identify the pharmacokinetic uh, characteristics about the uh, about the drug, and the other is about finding a uh, finding out the uh, maximum toler maximally tolerable dose (MTD). So let's get into a uh, phase one. Uh, there are many types of phase one study, actually in a way that uh, for some of the clinical trials, if, it, if it's difficult to classify into phase two or phase three, they just uh, uh, put them into phase one. One example would be bioequivalent studies. So we're gonna spend some effort just looking at uh, bioequivalent studies later. Now the first, uh, the first phase one study is always a first in human, FIH, all right? First in human. Uh, there is always a first person uh, test the first dose. What I tried to say is that it's not first 10 people test the first dose. Because if the first person had some uh, adverse events or some uh, severe reactions, you can stop developing the, the whole drug program rather than expose uh, this potential uh, toxic drug to more than one person. So you, you always start with uh, first in person. And then the dose escalation, last time I mentioned something about single rising dose and multiple rising dose, is about increase the doses so that we can find out the upper limit of the dose range and we call it dose escalation studies. A typical dose escalation study uh, will have a group of subjects that they start with the lowest dose. And then if they don't experience any adverse events, you recruit another group of subjects to, uh, to be exposed to the higher dose. And if there's no adverse events, you keep escalating the doses until you found some adverse events or some issues or some problems, and then you stop. You say, this is the maximum tolerable dose. Now, these kind of study designs are what we call the dose escalation designs. And the dose escalation design always started with the lowest dose. So what does it mean by lowest dose? That's why the preclinical pre studies are important. In preclinical studies, we have to look at toxicology 
which is to see the toxicity that caused animal problems or animal reactions. So from the toxic from the animal toxicity studies, you can establish a low dose. It is so low that you did not observe any adverse events from any of the animals you study. And we call it NOAEL, NOEL, non-observed adverse event level. So you, you start with the safest dose you can establish from the animal studies, which is NOAEL, and then you want to translate into human body. So this part of uh, studying a drug based on preclinical uh, evidence going into human, which is clinical evidence, this part is what we call translational medicine. You translate the findings from animal studies into human being. So in this translation of the NOAL into first in human dose, what you do is that you translate using a milligram per kilogram kind of translation, all right? So uh, you study like in mouse, in rabbit, or in guinea pig, or in whatever animals, and then when you translate in human, you use a body weight, right? Milligram per kilogram. It was different drug properties. Some drugs you may want to translate using a milligram per meter square of body sur surface area. So in a way, there is this milligram per kilogram translation is a three-dimensional translation. A milligram per meter square is a two-dimensional uh, translation. And of course, you can do 2.5, 2.7 um, dimensional uh, translation, whatever. From the animal studies, you want to translate into human. And that's where you start with the first human dose. That no well, once you translate the human, you also want to multiply by a safety factor like one tenth or one twentieth or something like that. Hopefully, that dose is very safe; it's not causing any problem. So you start first in human, and then you slowly escalate to a higher dose, to a higher dose until you stop at maximum tolerable dose. So. This is about tolerability. And another important objective of phase one is finding about PKPD, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So we touched on PK last time, and we're going to get into a lot of depths about pharmacokinetics today in this lecture. Biocooler study is a, is a very special kind of study uh, because there's no good place to put it, so we call it phase one. All right, so biocoolants, and we're going to talk about bioavailability bio studies, BA or BE. These type of studies, you go to uh, phase one, all right? And single dose multiple dose, we talked about it, uh, SRD being single dose, which is each subject is exposed to only a single dose. And if there's no uh, tolerability issues, you escalate. So you got SRD. Uh, single rising dose studies, or SAD, single ascending dose studies. Multiple dose, MRD or MAD, is you, you use the same dose strains, but expose the subject for many doses. Maybe you uh, expose the subjects uh, for uh, maybe a week or, or, or longer or something like that to observe any uh, potential um, uh, side effects or adverse events. So these are the single dose or multiple dose studies. And later when we talk about PK, we're gonna look at single dose PK and multiple dose PK could be different. And of course we'll cover food defect, uh, drug drug interaction with DDI uh, and QT or TQT, these kind of studies, they really don't have a place to go. So we just lump everything into phase one. All right, phase one studies has, has to achieve two major objectives. It's uh, categorize the PK profile and finding out about maximum tolerable dose. All right, when I say maximum tolerable dose, sometimes you, the drug is very safe. You keep escalating it, it's still very safe, but you have to stop somewhere because uh, maybe the pill is too big uh, for any 
anybody to take or they have to drink too, uh, too much water or liquid or something like that. So you have to stop somewhere. And so the highest dose may not be the dose that causes tolerability issues, but may be a dose beyond that is not feasible. So we call it maximally feasible dose, MFD. All right. So the two major objectives of phase one is understanding the PK profile and finding uh, or estimating MTD or MFD. So it's about those uh, dosing frequency and dose range. So phase one studies, you're learning the drug. So this, this drug candidate started from the preclinical uh, discovery stage. Uh, the labs came up with this drug and then eventually going through the preclinical uh, development, you take all kinds of observations, try to understand this drug candidate. Eventually you move into human being and before you give it to patients, you want to understand the dosing frequency and dose range throughout the phase one studies. We need to obtain this information to help us design phase two studies. So these two are the most critical information we need to obtain from phase one before we move into phase two. First thing, human. So always start with single dose, all right? And, and then you do a, a single rising dose or single ascending dose, and then you move into multiple doses. You start with the lowest dose based on preclinical findings. All right, that's where I mentioned about Noel. You translate Noel into a human dose and multiply it by a safety factor like one tenth or one twentieth or something like that. At this stage, you want to watch for target organ toxicity. Target organ toxicity is what we learn from the animal studies or what we learn from um, other drugs of the same class. And you escalate with predetermined dose spaces. So you, 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 you sort of slowly escalate the doses. And in, in FIH studies, you can also study PK if you design that way, all right? Of course, the major objective is finding about tolerability, but the meanwhile, you can, you can collect PK data and try to, try to understand the pharmacokinetics of this uh, drug candidate. All right, so what are the PK and PD? We mentioned uh, briefly last time about PK is what does the body work on the drug and PD is what does the drug work on the body. Uh, so we, we look at the concentration response uses PK uh, and should we consider PD, all right? Now this concentration response is a, is a, um, is a concept that's kind of, um, not very popular in the uh, uh, drugs uh, developed to treat chronic diseases because for chronic diseases, you want to have a fixed dose for the uh, patients to take for a long period of time. So con concentration response will be less uh, uh, convenient. So what does it mean by concentration response? All right, dose response is if you have this dose, now how does the patient respond to it? So that's the kind of uh, pharmacodynamics you're looking for. Now, concentration response is that instead of looking at whatever dose, but you try to give a certain amount of drug to the patient and then you draw the blood and find out their concentration and you adjust the concentration and then dose the patient. So that's concentration response. And that's, very, that's not very popular for, for chronic diseases. Now, how do we study PK? Uh, the pharmacokinesis, they came up with a bunch of what we call the PK parameters, pharmacokinetic parameters, including area on the curve, uh, maximum concentration, time to maximum concentration, half-life, elimination constant, and stuff like that. So we're gonna get into more details about these PK parameters. In phase one, PK, we're really focusing on ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So the drug get into your body. When we take the drug by mouth, orally, all right, when we take this drug uh, that goes through our GI system, right? So your body will have to absorb the drug first, all right? So absorption is the process of uh, substance entering uh, the blood circulation. So you have to go through this absor absorption stage. 
and then distribution. Once it goes through your blood distribution, <clears throat> uh, blood circulation that distributes to uh, all over your body. Distribution is a, a dispersion or dissemination of substances throughout the fluid and tissues of the body. So, of course, the most uh, uh, widely used uh, way of dispersion would be uh, your blood circulation, right? And then it goes through this metabolism stage. Is the irrever irreversible trans uh, transformation of parent compound into daughter uh, metabolites. So I mentioned briefly last time about this. Uh, uh, for chemical structure, the scientists at the lab, when they um, came up with this uh, compound, they probably have this basic chemical structure, and then they want to add up some other structures to make the compound more stable and more um, deliverable. Uh, and they, they want to satisfy all these drug properties like uh, permeability, uh, uh, solubility, all these chemical properties of the drug so that it will get into your body, uh, going into your GI system and all that. But once the drug goes through your system, uh, it goes through the circulation, it will get to your liver and the liver will try to break down the drug because your liver will recognize this is a foreign body comes to your uh, com coming into your system, and they try to break it down and stuff like that. And by going through that process, the compound is being metabolized, and the pieces that came out being the uh, metabolite, which is a daughter compound. All right. So the parent compound is a compound that part of the drug candidate that goes to your body, and then eventually. Uh, is being broken down into metabolites. And then excretion is the elimination of the substance from your body. In rare cases, some drugs uh, uh, irreversibly accumulate in the tissue uh, in the body where the excretion is very weak. Um, so ideally, you hope the drug will, will be out of your body after some time, okay? And we looked at this picture before. Let's look at this picture again. All right. Uh, so the way we study PK is by uh, looking at the blood concentration. So, or, or, or the they call it plasma concentration or whatever is the amount of drug you can measure from your blood or from your plasma. <clears throat> and like I said, at time zero. Uh, you have zero concentration. And then when time increases, the amount of drug in the body increases. Of course, for this measurement, you can measure the drug or you can measure the concentration uh, or you can make uh, measure the um, uh, metabolite. So uh, you, you sort of look at whatever the compound of the metabolites that can be found from your uh, bloodstream. And then of course, over time, the concentration increase and then decrease. And so the way you look at this curve is that how do you study it, right? So for PK study, as we see from here, uh, from, a, from a statistical point of view, this will be a longitudinal data set, right? Over time, you collected data over time and you try to describe, you try to understand this longitudinal data set. And in the PK analysis, the way they try to understand this longitudinal data is that the best way to do it, according to the pharmacokinesis, is that you try to simplify each of this curve into one value. All right, so how do you simplify it? You can do an area on the curve, which is you, you, you measure all of these, and up to this point in time, you, you sort of calculate this area from time zero to this time point, and from say time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, and so on and so forth. And then you can calculate this area. So they call it area on the curve. C max is the maximum concentration. So for this data set, the C max is right here. Or T max, T max is time at the maximum concentration, this time point being T max. 
and KEL, KEL being an uh, elimination constant. So in other words, what the uh, pharmacokinetics believe is that <clears throat> the curve, this time concentration curve, will go through your body eventually in a, um, in a uh, log relationship. So what you can do is that if you, if, you, if you look at all these observations over time and then you take a log and they believe as a, at a certain point in time, from that point on, the relationship of these observations to time would be a log relationship. So you take a log of uh, these observations against time, you can do a linear regression, all right? So based on the linear regression, you can calculate this, uh, this slope and you consider that slope being an elimination constant and they call it KEL. And the important part of it is that based on this, they can find out something they call half-life. That means how much does a drug, uh, how much time does it take for the drug to be out of your, to be out of your body by half amount? All right. So in other words, if you figure at this point in time, it's only a uh, half of half amount of the drug, and the same amount of time later is only a quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, and stuff like that. They want to find about half life, which is the amount of time it takes to excrete fifty percent of the drug. All right. Uh, we talk about single dose, multiple dose, right? Um, in early phase one studies, most studies are single dose designs, all right? Uh, so you just give the subject one dose and you study the PK, all right? If a participant takes more than one dose, this is what we call multiple dose study, all right? So you give the subject one dose and you study the PK. And like in this case, this is a single dose data set, all right? Subject takes just one dose, you follow for 24 hours. And this is a multiple dose data set. The subject take one dose and redose, and maybe redose, maybe redose, so they're multiple doses, all right? If, if a participant takes more than one dose, that is considered a multiple dose study. And PK reaches steady state after multiple doses. So let's take a look at this picture here. All right. So you have, if this subject takes a single dose, just a single dose. So theoretically speaking, for a single dose over time, the drug hopefully will be uh, excreted out of your body. Uh, after a certain amount of period, all right? Now, so this is a single dose sort of PK, all right? Now, multiple dose PK is that, if, in this case, if you redose at 24 hours, all right? So you redose ap after 24 hours, then what happened? Now, the drug concentration did not drop to zero yet, but now you have a newer dose, so your PK profile looks like an increase again, all right? Now, after the second dose, if you redose, it goes a little higher again. It goes a little higher again. Eventually, it will reach a steady state, all right? So PK reaches steady state after multiple doses. So when, when, when people are talking about uh, PK parameters like Cmax, this is Cmax, right? And this is the second dose Cmax, this is the third dose Cmax. And eventually you got a steady state Cmax, okay? And this is AUC, area on the curve, right? You sort of integrate from time zero up to infinity to get your uh, AUC, all right? And this is a time of the maximum concentration, that's T max. So T max will be maybe two hours or something like that. So that's your T max. All right. So this is C max, the maximum concentration. 
of the single dose. That's a T max of single dose. All right. This is the C max of steady state. And this from here to here is a T max of the steady state. And uh, they have this AUC uh, at uh, single dose, single dose AUC. All right. And this will be a steady state AUC. All right. Now, be careful that here you want to integrate up to infinity. Here you'll only integrate up to the next time point, all right? From time 72 to uh, time 96, all right? So these are different kinds of areas in the curve. Now, the other parameter, PK parameter, they talk about is T half, time, so half-life, time it takes to, uh, excrete half of the amount of drug in your body. That's the T half, half life. So from here to here, you left only one half. From here to here, has only one quarter. From here, the same amount, you got one eighth, one sixteenth, and so on and so forth. So that's the half life. And we need to know the half life in order to understand how to dose a patient. So remember, I mentioned last time that phase one trials for most of the chronic diseases, we use healthy volunteers. We do not use patients because healthy volunteers, we can study a clean PK. So we don't have to worry about the patient's um, ADME got affected by the disease or got affected by other drugs they're taking. So it's important that phase one, we use health, uh, healthy volunteers. All right. Now, another point to look at is that this AUC infinity versus AUC T is a sort of different concept. All right. Even though we're looking at AUC, the way you calculate this area of the curve, but AUC infinity, we never get to observe infinity, right? Uh, in this, in this picture, we only observe up to uh, 96 hours. All right. We, we were able to observe four doses. Now, how do you get to infinity? So here's the thing what, uh, when I mentioned about uh, KEL will be important. So if the pharmacokinists look at these data, all right, of course, if you're doing a single dose study, you continue to collect data points from here, right? And they say, all right, from maybe from this point onward, from this point onward, it become log linear, all right? So from this point onward, they take a lot of transformation, all right? And so this will be your Y, and you take time as your X, you run a linear regression on the log scale of concentration, all right? That uh, regression will give you a slope estimate. The slope estimate will be your KEL, your uh, <clears throat> uh, elimination constant, all right? That KEL, now, if you have the KEL, and what you do is that you only observe up to 24 hours, for example. And then from here onward, you use the KEL to estimate the, uh, the relationship between time and concentration uh, up to infinity. So you can come up with some kind of estimate, all right? So when you say AUC infinity, it's actually equal to AUC from zero to T, time t plus AUC from t to infinity, all right? So that's AUC infinity. But in most cases, we have AUC t. We're just studying this time interval from 24 hours, like right? here is from 72 to 96 or from zero to 24 or whatever. You just look at AUC t, which is the amount of drug concentration in your body for the first like up to T hours or something like that, up to T time points. So that's AUC T. And from here onward is AUC T to infinity. You add up these two pieces, that'll give you AUC infinity. So these are some kind of basic introduction about the uh, PK parameters. So when we study uh, drug concentration, we study the uh, uh, PK characteristics 
how does a human body metabolize a drug? You look at these parameters, you look at Cmax, Tmax, AUC, T half, KEL, and some other PK parameters. So for each subject, we were able to observe these kind of PK parameters. And when you perform statistical analysis, you look at like mean AUC, mean Tmax, mean Cmax. Uh, that's how you perform statistical analysis. Because these data points, although being longitudinal, but the pharmacokinesis will simplify it into one number, a single number, either AUC or Cmax or, or, or T half, they, they reduce it to a single dimensional um, value. And then uh, if you have like 20 subjects, you can perform an analysis based on the mean standard deviation of the 20 subjects, try to make sense out of it. Uh, so, we sort of introduced this basic idea about PK study. Uh, again, I want to come back and review the point that in PK or in phase one, for most cases, we're looking at healthy uh, normal volunteers. We're not looking at patients. So because from the healthy volunteers, we can have a more uh, kind of pure uh, PK profile so that the, these PK profiles are not affected by the disease or not affected by the drug patients take to control that disease. So this way we will have a clean PK. Now, the next idea I'm going to introduce is about bioavailability and bioequivalence. They call it BABE, all right? Bioavailability and bioequivalence. So before talking about bioavailability, I want to focus on bioequivalence, all right? So why is bioequivalence important and what it is about, all right? So bioavailability and bioequivalence are considered only from PK point of view. So in other words, we're not looking at drug efficacy, we're not looking at safety, we're only looking at the PK uh, characteristics of PK profile from the phase one uh, subjects, all right? typically established with AUC and Cmax, okay? And other PK parameters are usually not used in bioavailability and bioequivalence. So before we get into the concept of uh, equivalence, uh, let's try to describe what, what is that thing? What is bioequivalence, all right? Now, if in my company, I'm developing a new drug and the, uh, the chemists, uh, they were able to formulate this drug, all right? They were able to formulate uh, into a, for example, a 10 milligram tablet, all right? So we got 10 milligram tablets. But by the time when we want to market this drug, we want to market 20 milligrams. So at this time, the company may want to formulate a 20 milligram tablet. Now, do we know two of the 10 milligram tablets is equivalent to a single 20 milligram tablet? All right, intuitively we, intuitively we think that should be the case, right? But how can we prove that? All right, if you look at these pictures, the 10 milligram, uh, time concentration profile may look like this. The 20 milligram may look at, look like that, right? Now, what does it mean by a 20 milligram PK equals two of the 10 milligram PK? Or how do we know that? So what you do is you allow the subject to take two 10 milligram tablets and if you have the same subject, again, take a single 20 milligram tablet, and then you look at their PK profile. If they look good enough, then you will say, yeah, we're able to demonstrate bioequivalence. Okay. So that's one way of looking at it. The other way to look at it is that if we were in the clinical trial stage, uh, when there's some difficulties in formulating a tablet, 
but they were able to formulate some capsules. So you got 10 milligram tab capsules uh, going through your clinical trial, phase one, phase two, phase three, 10 minute, 10, 10 minute capsules. And while we're doing clinical trials, try to study the different properties of the drug, the formula formulation group is still improving their formulation uh, strategy. And by the time we want to market the drugs, they have 10 milligram tablets. So do we know the 10 milligram capsules and 10 milligram tablets, they have the same properties? So then you want to do a bioequivalent study. All right. So of course, from a uh, from a company discovering, developing new drugs, these are the bioequivalents that we're looking at. But it's more critically for generic companies. All right. As we know, the new drugs are patented, and each patent is 20 years. So 20 years from the day you're applying for the patent. So we came up with a new drug, and after 20 years, the drug is off patent. And now what? Generic companies, they can make generic drugs, right? So they want to make a generic copy of our drug. Now, the generic company will have to apply for FDA approval to say we can have this generic drug uh, market to replace this brand name drug, all right? Now, FDA wants to look at the generic drug and say, how can I, how can I believe that your generic drug is equivalent, quote unquote, with the brand name drug? And then FDA wants to look at the bioequivalent study. So at this stage, the generic company will have to demonstrate about equivalence to FDA. Now that's why bioequivalence become a very critical property for that generic drug, right? Because generic companies, the, the reason they want to make generic copy of this uh, new drug is because they can make it in a, in a cheaper way, all right? They can lower the cost, they can lower the price so that they can be more competitive than the brand name drug. In that way, it is not fair to ask the generic company to redo phase one, phase two, phase three studies, because we know phase three studies are very expensive. And even for major companies, like right now I'm working for Berger Ingelheim, I used to work for Pfizer, and you look at other big companies, Eli Lilly, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, all these big companies, they have to invest a lot of money to come up with a new drug. Now for generic drug, you ask them to go through all the phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and they say, well, I may as well forget it, forget about it. No need to, uh, to, to make a generic drug because so so expensive. So FDA will come up with this way of using bioequivalence for the approval of generic drugs. All right. So bioequivalence introduces a fundamental difficulty from a statistical point of view. Because statistical hypothesis says, the null hypothesis says the two formulations are the same. And the alternative hypothesis says they're different. So what we do with this, all right, we have a reference formulation or, or test formulation and reference formulation. So we have a we have distribution on the test formulation, and we have another distribution on the reference formulation. If I increase sample size, I can separate these two, right? We know the two populations are never the same, right? The test formulation, so I have a population taking the uh, test formulation, the, the generic copy of, of the, the drug. And I have another group of subjects are taking the uh, uh, brand name drug. And if I measure their concentrations, then these two concentrations when you increase sample size, they're never the same. You know, two, two distributions, you can, by increased sample size, you can always separate them. So what we did in drug efficacy is to say, if my test drug is different from placebo, I can reject the null and FDA can approve it by saying, well, the probability that the drug is a placebo is very low, it's controlled under alpha, so we can approve the drug. But bioequivalence is different. All right, bioequivalence, your null hypothesis being they're different 
and you try to show their equivalent, all right? So in the typical hypothesis testing, you reject now if you observe p-value is less than alpha, and statistically speaking, two distributions are never the same. As sample size increase, the two distributions separate, and we can power the study using alpha and beta. However, there's a concept of equivalence in real life. We buy things and hope the value of our dollar is equivalent to the value of the things we purchase. For FDA, they have to approve or reject generic drug that is claimed to be equivalent to the brand name drug. So how can you approve a generic drug when they claim they're equivalent to the brand name drug? All right. If we need to prove equivalence, we switch the null and alternative hypothesis from above. By increasing sample size, it works against the alternative hypothesis. In other words, if you look at this, all right, if we switch these two uh, hypotheses, so our null being they're different, our alternative being they're equivalent, then what you do is that if I increase sample size, they look similar. Right? If I increase sample size, they always look different. So that becomes a statistical dilemma. So how do you test the hypothesis the other way around? To say my null hypothesis being mu1 not equal to mu2, and I want to prove the alternative hypothesis of mu1 equal to mu2. So how to do that? FDA need to make a decision. All right? So, the 1992 uh, bioequivalence guidance, the 1992 bioequivalence guidance is called ABE, average bioequivalence. So here's what they do, all right? Bioequivalence can be evaluated based on average bioequivalence. And here's their rule. Their rule is 90% confidence interval on the ratio of geometric mean of two formulations is contained within the limits of 0.8 to 1.25. Let's try to understand this, okay? The pharmacokinesis believes that the drug concentration data follows log normal distribution, all right? So if we're looking at mu1 minus mu2, all right? Mu1 being the uh, test formulation, mu2 being the reference formulation, all right? Mu1 minus mu2. Now, if you take log transformation before you take the mu1 minus mu2. Then uh, the mu1 minus mu2 becomes a geometric mean ratio, right? So if you look at x being your raw data and you say y being log of x, now, if you look at mean of y, the y bar, all right, y bar being sum of y divided by n, or being the multiplication of the all the axes and taking n's root and log it, all right. Now, when you multiply all the axes and take the nth root, that's, that's your geometric mean, right? But when we look at y1 bar minus y2 bar, that's essentially the log of geometric mean 1 over geometric mean 2, which is the geometric mean ratio. Now, if the two formulations are equivalent, then that ratio should be equal to 1. And here's the FDA requirement, all right? The 1992 ABE guidance says, if you look at, if you look at the geometric mean ratio, so I have a sample size of maybe 10 or 20 or something like that. So I got, say 20, all right? I got 20, 20 subjects on the uh, test formulation, 20, 20 subjects on the um, reference formulation. And, if I look at the geometric mean ratio of AUC, all right, test formulation over reference formulation, geometric mean ratio, they should be equal to one, right? Now I got uh, observed value, of course, uh, because randomness in the, 
it's not likely to observe something exactly one. You're going to observe something maybe 0.99 or 1.01 or something like that. And then you do a confidence interval on the findings. If that confidence interval, the 90% confidence interval, is between 0.8 and 1.25, the FDA says, okay, you're able to demonstrate uh, equivalence. So that's the guts of this ABE uh, uh, guidance. All right, let, let, let's take a look at this graph here, all right? If you want to show superiority, which is null hypothesis being uh, the test formulation and the reference formulation the same, all right? Alternative hypothesis being they're different. Now, for bioequivalence, you're looking at the different thing. The null hypothesis being they're not equivalent, the alternative hypothesis being they're equivalent. So if you come up with this 0 0.8 1.25, right? 0 0.8 and 1.25, you take log transformation of 0 0.8, that will be a negative value. You take log transformation of 1.25, that will be a positive value. And this is your zero right here, okay? Now you're looking at the mean differences on the log scale. So generic drug A is different from the Brennan drug because not only the point estimate is lower than the uh, than the reference formulation, but also the confidence interval is outside of these two limits, right? And of course, B is not bioequivalent. It's interesting to look at C, right? C give you a bioequivalence, right? But the problem is the interval width is too wide. So with FDA guidance, that encourage the generic company to increase sample size, because when you observe this, if your sample size is large enough, your interval width is going to be narrow enough that will put you back in between minus delta and delta. Okay. And of course, for uh, generic drug D is bioequivalent. All right. No problem. I mean, the uh, lower limit is greater than one point, uh, greater than 0.8, and upper limit is less than 1.25. Of course, you take log, log transformation. So that's bioequivalent. That's fine. And same with E. Uh, it's interesting to look at F. All right, F is statistically significantly different from zero. All right, your test formulation has a concentration higher than the reference formulation. But the confidence interval is within the minus delta and delta. Can you approve for bioequivalence? And FDA says, yes, we can approve for bioequivalence because they're concerned about the lower confidence limit and the upper confidence limit is smashed between 0.8 and 1.25. So this is bioequivalence. Of course, G is not bioequivalent. All right. Now, for bioequivalent studies, typically they use crossover designs. So in other words, as one subject take formulation A, another subject take formulation B. No, no, let, let me say that again, sorry. F the same subject take formulation A first, and after a washout, the same subject will take formulation B. All right, so this is what they call a sequence one. So you randomize subjects into sequences, two sequences, all right? If the subject randomized to sequence one, the subject will take formulation A first, and after a washout, the same subject will take formulation B. If the subject is randomized to sequence two, that subject will take formulation B first, and after a washout, take formulation A. So it's, it's a crossover design. So based on crossover design, this is how your, your analytical model look like, all right? This is your response. This is a log transformed uh, PK parameter. It's either Cmax or UC, log transform equal to mu and sequence, I mean, the subjects randomized to sequence one or two. And subject is nested within sequence. And this is the treatment, the formulation, all right? And this is period and the residual. And here's, if you use a plot TLM, how do you perform uh, analysis using SAS? So we're looking at hypothesis testing, right? But FDA is using confidence interval, 
But last time I mentioned that hypothesis testing is for confirmatory purposes and confidence interval is for estimation purposes. Fundamentally, these two practices are different. Exploratory questions and the confirmatory questions are totally different. Exploratory questions, we're learning, we're trying to understand. Confirm confirmatory questions is we're making a decision or right? approve the drug or not approve a drug. Now, FDA is dealing with this uh, decision of approving or not approving a generic drug. So the nature is a positive testing uh, question. But they're proposing estimation. All right? Company zero by nature is estimation. So how do they make sense out of this? All right. But Kuhn's problem is not a positive testing problem. All right? We use 90% confidence interval to estimate. Now, however, you set the rule of 0.8, 1.25 to make a decision. So this is a two one-sided test concept. All right, let's take a look at it. What does it mean by two one-sided test? Here it is. The null is the test formulation is too high or too low. Right, here's your upper limit, here's the lower limit. Now, if you reject this null, that means your geometric mean ratio is smashed in between 0.8 and 1.25, and then you can claim equivalence. So this is the nature of bioequivalence. It's a two one-sided test. So the Bioequivalence or biosimilarity are two-sided tests or two one-sided tests. All other clinical trials are one-sided tests. All right, you're trying to show superiority or non-inferiority. It's directional. It's only one way. The drug has to be better than the control or not inferior to the control. So it's a one-sided test. But bioequivalence by nature is a two one-sided test. It's inverting a confidence interval into two one-sided tests. And here is the 1992 guidance. The 1992 guidance says FDA requires both AUC and CMAX to satisfy this 0.8 to 1.25 rule to approve for bioequivalence. So if both your AUC and CMAX were able to demonstrate this confidence interval, 90% confidence in all is smashed in between 0.8 and 1.25, then FDA says this general drug is approvable. So I hope you have a good understanding about bioequivalence. Because once you understand bioequivalence, the other studies are a lot easier to understand. All right. Bioavailability. Bioavailability is in fact very much like a bioequivalent study in the following sense. All right, so what, what do you mean by bioavailability? If you look at the drug label um, for an oral drug, it says it's 70% uh, bio, bioavailable, all right? 70% bioavailable, what does that mean? So you go through the same thing of the geometric mean ratio, but you're looking at the denominator being the IV formulation. So you take the same amount of drug by IV that uh, intravenous, you're delivering the drug into your blood vessel. So you will get immediate uh, circulation of the drug in your body. So for that kind of formulation, you would get 100% bioavailable. Now, if you take of the oral drug and you look at the PK, uh, the, the PK parameters. And if it's 70% to the IV formulation, then that says is 70% bioavailable. So that's the idea of bioavailability. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot about tolerability. We talk about tolerability, to tolerability being those escalation studies from low dose uh, ver uh, Noel, right? Uh, multiplied by safety factor, you very low dose, you keep increasing, you're looking at tolerability, you won't stop at MTD, maximum tolerable dose. But availability is the way I just described. Now, food effect is the same way. Food effect is just like bioequivalent studies, is that 
you randomize patients to two sequences. Sequence one, the subject will take the drug first. And after uh, the washout, the subject will take the same drug, but with food. If you randomize to sequence two, you take drug with food first. And then after you wash out, you take the drug by itself. And now we have a crossover study, right? The cross, crossover study being drug with food and drug without food. If you're able to demonstrate their bioequivalent, then you say there's no food effect, all right? So remember, when you look at the new drug, when we're taking a, the drug, you look at the label, it says take the drug with food or take the drug without food or stuff like that. That's based on food effect studies. And of course, you can do with food or without food. And you can do with food, uh, uh, with low fat food or high fat food, with uh, uh, a low protein food, high protein food. You can do all this kind of stuff to look at how does a PK change with food. If there's no change, then you say there's no food effect. And of course, you can do DDI, drug-drug interaction, is that you randomize patients to, to sequence one and sequence two. If you're in sequence one, you take drug by itself first. And after the washout, take the drug plus another drug. And then you look at the PK of the study drug. And the same thing, if you randomize to sequence two, you take this drug with another drug. And after a washout, you take just the study drug itself. And you look at, if for this particular drug, you want to see if it's interacting with your study drug, you do a DDI and you were able to demonstrate a bioequivalence, then you say there's no DDI. If there's not bioequivalence, then you say your study drug could be interacted with the other, this other drug. So once you understand bioequivalence, you can understand bioavailability, food effect, DDI. The last thing will be uh, QT. So we're going to uh, take a look at. Uh, all right. Now, bioavailability is expressed in PK parameters and typically in terms of uh, percentages uh, of uh, uh, percentage of IV formulation, many study for all the deliver drugs. And food effect and DDI are the same thing, right? So we talk about this. Now, I want to look at some, something about QT, right? Now, this is uh, EKG or ECG, electrocardiogram, all right? So EKG or ECG is considered a safety parameter, all right? Uh, this happened uh, in late 90s. Before late 90s, uh, uh, ECG is not a standard safety parameter. After the 90s, there were some events, so you come up with ECG as a safety parameter. So how do you study safety? Now, here is an electrocardiogram for one heartbeat. Right? If you look at the uh, ECG wave, uh, it looks like this. And it breaks down into a P wave, a Q wave, a R wave, a S wave, and T wave, all right? Now the concern is that they don't want the QT to be too long, from Q to T. They don't want QT to be too long, all right? If the QT is too long, that will cause a problem they call tosard, which is a form of arrhythmia. That means your heart rate is not regulated, all right? So, so you want to do a study to understand whether your drug would cause a QT prolongation or not. So how do they, how do, how do they study this? So they want to look at QT and they want to look at an adjustment because some people has a faster heart rate then that means the entire wave is shorter and some people would have a, a a slow heart rate so that means this whole wave is very long i mean these are measured in terms of milliseconds all right so you need to make some adjustment so they do a qt divided by square root of r r you from R to another R, this one heartbeat. So that's what they call QTC, QT being corrected by heart rate, all right? Now, 
If you look at the total QT study, they call TQT. Somebody called a thorough QT study, same TQT. Right? ECG is considered as a safety variable. And the main concern is QT prolongation. And QTC is a corrected QT. And TQT uh, <clears throat> is designed with matching time points. We look at ICH E14. So let me describe, so that's your ECG curve, right? Uh, let me describe uh, one kind of uh, TQT study design. This will be a 48 hour study. So the subject, so the participant will carry a holder monitor. So you carry this monitor at specific, uh, at, at pre-specified time, this monitor will do the QT for you, will catch the QT. Or look at your heart rate, look at the uh, uh, ECG curve. So the 48 hour study start, start like that. If we say eight o'clock in the morning of day zero, for example, uh, the subject will carry this holder monitor. So at eight o'clock, uh, it will measure your uh, ECG and calculate the QT or QTC, all right? At 8.20, it'll calculate another QT, uh, 8.40, nine o'clock, uh, 9.20, 9.40 until 7.40 the next day, day one. So this day zero, the subject is not on any drug, all right? And you got a 24-hour uh, QT profile. And between uh, 7.40 and 8 o'clock the next day, in day one, the subject is dosed with a study drug. And then 8 o'clock, there's a Q, uh, uh, ECG, you do the QT, 820, 840, 9 o'clock until 750 of day two. So you got a 48 hour kind of ECG. And you do a time match, you look at the uh, day one, 8 a.m. QTC minus day zero, 8 a.m. QTC. And you do the 820, 840, you do this 24 hour sort of uh, QTC difference. You can find the maximum difference for that subject. So if you, you have 20 subjects going through this study, you look at the maximum of these difference. Every subject gives you a maximum. The mean cannot exceed five milliseconds. And the confidence rule, the upper limit of confidence rule cannot exceed 10 milliseconds. If your drug were able to demonstrate this successfully, you say, all right, we don't have a QT problem. So this is pretty much I want to cover about phase one. Thank you.